Registered Phenomena Code 931 Object Class Gamma Purple Hazard Types Pending Further Classification Containment Protocols While containment of RPC-931 is currently observed through paranatural means via Care Ashland's anomalous border, growth fluctuations in recent years have led to mounting fears that its autonomous containment there may no longer be viable. See Sighting 931-04 Christened Pages End by Authority Operatives, this boundary remains the most unpredictable aspect of the Care Ashland Anomaly, growing more erratic and unstable in effect in recent years. Most manifested denizens of Care Ashland assume its more modern corrosive effects are just another aspect of the corruption within the novels. Though as of late, new strains of devotional rhetoric, possibly mimetic in origin, have begun to arise, which pose explicit problems for local Camp Karnak operatives. While direct armed conflict with RPC-931 is proven futile, alternative ritualistic means aimed to prevent the entity from targeting Authority assets have been developed by Prometheus Primogenitus personnel. RPC-931 displays heightened aggression to all peoples and objects non-indigenous to Care Ashland. From the Society of Blessed Brian and the Sons of Dagda, groups registered in the Department for Occult Concerns under the Bureau of Acquisition liaise for Thaumaturgical Research in the Care Ashland. These beliefs are based upon localized folkloristic dogmas sourced from various communities partnered with the Authority Mediators in Care Ashland. See below. Temporary Party Authority personnel deployed to Care Ashland are to be issued Yannis Wards upon their arrival. Yannis Wards see figure one, are protective talismans crafted from woven punica gratitum leaves. More advanced versions of Yannis Wards, complete with inscribed protection prayers from the Gottis Ott and other relevant sources, are to be disseminated among permanent party personnel. Whenever possible, Personnel must attempt to make pilgrimage to the sickly marshes and lustrate themselves within the Drowning Well. The Drowning Well is a site of ritualistic suicide for those devout to RPC-931. While suicide is animated by nearly all religious sects, the Drowning Well allows those who commit the act to quote, remain close to its waters of holy rebirth. Unquote. Suicides are usually performed in groups of approximately 21 or more. Synchronous reports have confirmed that those christened in its waters no longer arouse RPC-931's agitated state. As of July 27, 2028, no colloquially sourced incantation, ward, or ritual has proven successful in wholly deterring RPC-931 from its unidentified goal. Other means of containment more geared towards restraint permanence are currently being devised by Dr. Locke and the Chief Care Ashland staff. All Authority personnel should be prepared for a possible emergence incident in the event that RPC-931 attempts to breach containment. Incident Log 166-67 Date November 2, 2028 Staff Participants Captain Fields Containment ANV Wintersheimer Dr. Rissa Containment Resident Medical Liaison Dr. Taggart Research, Department of Occult Concerns Mission Task Locate further remnants of RPC-931's emergence and ascertain additional clues to the anomaly's whereabouts. Forward. An atypical male was rescued approximately ten knots off the southern shore of Pabe Island. The unidentified subject, henceforth referred to as John Doe, was recovered displaying signs of acute hypothermia and respiratory trauma due to water inhalation. The subject is noted to be unusually large, more than 2 meters in height, with no other notable identifiers or defects. The subject is scheduled for interrogation, following their transfer to Site-007 two days post-retrieval, en route to Pabe proper. Due to the recent emergence incident on Care Ashland, all Authority personnel within the vicinity of the island have been placed in heightened awareness as per protocol. Dealing with Mr. Doe through either amnestization or permanent containment is of the utmost importance. Suceration settles as Dr. Taggart takes the seat across from Mr. Doe, placing his pages down carefully. 
Quite the surprise seeing you up and awake. Your heart was barely beating when we found you. You were all blue. Mr. Doe does not respond. I believe the exact words Rissa told me about your recovery was that it was nothing short of a miracle. Mr. Doe continues not to reply. Perhaps we can start off with your name? Silence. You'll have to talk to me at some point. You know, it's not every day we find a giant such as yourself near drowned while trawling. Yes, trawling. Is there anyone we can try and contact? A ship you were on, maybe? You know the waters we found you in are restrict- Mr. Doe mutters something inaudible under his breath. What was that? My son, my… Sir? My son. I have to… need to find him. He's Earth, I think. Your son? Listen! Ugh! Me whole body hurts. You said you found me. Where? At sea, leagues from the mainland. Can't say exactly, but too far out for a leisurely swim. What's the last thing you remember? Ugin… Uh, I would never… What about now? Where are we? We're more or less in Scotland waiting for your medical reports to come in. Scotland? The Isles? I'm home. Ah, now we're getting somewhere. So you're from here. Scotland, I mean. I need to find him. Maybe he's close too. He was hurt. I know I saw it with me own eyes. I've already lost one son. I can't lose another. I. Calm down, sir. We can help, but we can't do much unless you work with us. Make this go quicker. Aye, right. You're right. Mr. Doe remains silent. Are you a man of faith, Mr. Doe? <laughs> Strange question for an interrogation. Not an interrogation, just some questions, aimed to help jog that jumbled memory of yours a bit. If you're a local, I can only assume the faith may have touched you at one point or another. <laughs> Aye, been one me whole life, uh, I think, anyway. You think? It's odd, all a bit floaty. But you remember your boy. He must be important, then. I can promise that we'll find… Don't think you are, though. What? A man of faith you aren't. Baptized under the Church of England as a Baptized under the Church of England as a boy. Harder to hold on to these days, especially with my love of the literary critics and applying them to scripture. But it's enough. We've more in common than you think, sir. Besides, doesn't change the fact I can see you're troubled and more than a little lost. A found belief helps in times like these. But your eyes. You don't believe in it. Not really. Does that bother you? They say a clear eye is a sign of a holy soul. What the soul you must see in me? <coughs> Faith. A pretty word. Bah! I've had me feel of it. Enough to last lifetimes. I set my whole world upon it, even. But I'm supposing that wasn't enough if what you say is true. Pardon? What I said? Silence. What did I say, sir? <sighs> Liam. You asked for me name. It's Liam. Description. RPC-931 is a beatific draconian entity of unknown size and ability. It is referenced within Gowron's writings as a purely deific being, and as such it is known by multiple names and titles among the endemic peoples of Kerr Ashland, including, but not limited to, Celasta, the Rhapsodist of Reverence, the King That Was, The Empty Crown, Creator, Cleric of the Cosmos, The Horned Prophet, and most predominantly Ah Lim the Gleaming. RPC-931 never officially appears in Gowron's novels, although echoes of his actions are pervasive in most narrative threads in the stories themselves, despite he himself being physically absent for their entirety. All mentions of RPC-931 within the book series are attributed as male. It is currently believed that RPC-931 came into being at irregular intervals following a hypothesized inception point, believed to have occurred sometime after a four-year period, succeeding Kerr Ashland's initial manifestation in the summer of 2020. The exact nature of its dilatorious entry in the later half of 2025 remains a matter of debate among researchers. Although, 
the most common belief based on a re-examination of formerly disregarded reports of aberrative circumstances and partial sightings is that RPC-931's arrival was hindered due to its possible imperfect transference within the point of extreme incoherency during initial manifestation. Partial sighting is used in a literal sense here, such as reports of animated draconian skeletal remains in flight, or unusual large mounds of off-toned teratomatous flesh, manifesting and demanifesting at random. Depictions of RPC-931 vary from culture to culture but comparative analysis by field researchers and historians stationed at Camp Karnak have identified several key characteristics concordant throughout all relevant sources. RPC-931 is consistently depicted as the largest dragon to have ever existed, or will ever exist with wings boundless as the night sky. Earlier epic songs and other long-form poetry retrieved from various strains of Elphus tradition, such as the Lay of Presbyterianus make frequent mention of its thick blue iron scales, which weighed a talent each, and its spiraled horns akin to that of a ram. One of the more frequently appearing sagas within the known elven world in Kerr Ashland, it is perhaps the most quoted external piece of fictitious literature within the series. From what little is clear within the Ispasoich, Gowring's unreleased creation story, Presbyter Giannis is a mythical founding poet and hero who arrived in Kerr Ashland in his first cycle, a performer of miracles and an emissary of gods with the gift of a silver tongue. It is strongly suspected by congregants researchers that this character is a reference to the legendary king Prester John from the Nestorian Christian tradition, though he also bears a strong resemblance to Finn McCool from Gaelic founding mythology. These later became the standard interpretation though subsequent other non-canonical and more non-conventional features have been recorded from reports post-manifestation of the Kerr Ashland anomaly, including eyes on the underside of the wings, the mane of a lion, and in the unpublished incomplete Epics of Perusia as a man. Due to RPC-931's assigned ascetic nature, its anomalous capabilities are immeasurable. It is, for all intents and purposes, within the boundaries of the Kerr Ashland anomaly a god. Moreover, even with our limited observation of the entity, we've seen it rearrange chronological events, demanifest objects and itself at will, and display complete autonomy over matter manipulation. See Addendum 931.01. Members of the AET assigned with the observation, experimentation, and examination of the property of the Kerr Ashland's anomalous border have begun to suspect that RPC-931 may pose a significant threat to the stability of the pocket's semi-permeable dimensional barrier. Anomaly Experimentation Team And your surname? McDonald Risa, can you look that name up? See if we have anything on file? Any other relations? I cannot recall. You… can't recall? I don't can… I just… Are you just gonna keep dancing around like this? No dancing, just questions. I promise they're important. Thought you were gonna help me find the boy. Stop that thing swear with me. We will, we will. There are already people looking. We will find him, sir. I swear it. Bold of you to lie so blatantly, have it on about. You should find him. It won't make sense if you don't. Make sense? Bugger it! Doesn't matter. Right. Tagger clears his throat loudly, grabbing a sheet of paper from the nearby drawer. So, a son, you said. You've only mentioned one child. No wife or other kids? My wife? Did I have a wife? I'm sure you… Nay, I had two bairns. Boys. Aye, aye, two. Brian and Meshu. Had? Brian's… he's… he's not around anymore. Family qualms or something more serious? I cannot say. I don't remember. I don't want to. So then, Meishu. He's who you're looking for, yes? Can you describe him for me? He's like me, just we. He's still a lad, red hair, brightest blue eyes you ever seen. Always smiled. 
He liked to sing and draw a lot, see? Just like me when I was a lad. We'd always make stories that escaped him. Could never quite finish him either. I used to tease him for it. <laughs> you speak as though you haven't seen him in years. Aye. It feels like it. I see him still, when I close my eyes, sitting at this old desk above me somewhere, tooling away, hiding his drawings while he's supposed to be nosing the good book. When I go to him, he's old and gray, eyes like the void. <sighs> Don't suppose I can have some paper to sketch a bit. My mind's full of places and things that I can't make out. More dreams. Of course, of course. Dr. Taggart removes a small notebook from under the desk, sliding it across the table to Liam, along with a black fountain pen. Is this alright? Aye. It's… it's good. Aye. Alright, let's try this again. Tell me, Mr. MacDonald. And try your hardest this time. What even is the last thing you remember? Liam takes a long breath. After several minutes of silence, he speaks. That was easy, sir. Fire. Addendum 931.01 Informational Excerpt Transcribed below are several abridged choruses and verses from the Ispasuich. They have been selected for reference here for their relevance to RPC-931. Original text sourced from Gowron's notes and in-world religious scriptures displayed on the left. Authority abridged sections on the right, sick throughout. Excerpt 01 Creation the Canticle of Tosigasir, as sung by Presbyter Giannis. Ere the sundering of the six suns, ere the world was confined in immutable firmament, ere even the first elves were born in their starry jeweled nets beyond the veil of night, there was only nothing. This nothing was quiet, formless, empty. This nothing was the place of the low, deep waters, those dusty, stagnant realms where things lay formless and dreams were trapped in the hanging dark. But nothing cannot last, it gorged upon itself. The foam of the endless sea took shape as a toothy maw, swallowed whole at once, became the dragon, for he had consumed all that is, was, and will be, and felt that it was good. Birth through the gates of his teeth and the fire of his gullet as song. The first notes, inchoate were as the undigested waters separating land. Their gentle lapping added to the pursuance. Raucously it rang, the hymn of creation. The verse took deeper shape as the second sagacious notes became the sky. The chorus was as the rising and setting of the sun, and it was good. The totality of heaven burned beyond his eyes, as his crownless kingdom formed. He who gave himself size had harmonized all its contents. The fire of his stomach set first, the sun who was fleeting, the wild waters ameliorated in his image, given purpose and direction. The earth and air, so lofty forgotten, all came to be under his avertipoise ardor, and he felt that it was good. According to authority scholars, fire and water's equivoked meanings throughout the Ispasoich allowed both the elves and humans to claim racial superiority as Alem's firstborn. Water according to human historians, represents the early elves before they extinguished the primordial flame and were broken against their ancestors as the river. Dwarves and lesser dragons portray earth and air respectively. Although racial and class warfare were common themes throughout most of Gowring's works, these specific chauvinistic beliefs are suspected to have developed independently. Excerpt 02 Description Gottest Ott, as sung as Presbyterianus Early morning found me in my fishing boat, out on the bright waters of the Crimson River. The dawn had come slowly that day, its tiding heralded by a roar of innumerable shofars and a brassy blue light, and I was afraid. Perched upon the sun at the horizon sat the dragon. His horns spiraled out among the stars. They were as that of a ram. Smoke crept from his snout forming the mist that called to far-off lands, as his wings unfurled and it was the blackest of midnight. There was no need for light or lamp in the presence of the Holy of Holies. His sheer colossal form at such propinquity blinded me. 
scales were tightly racked against one another, as the shields of a longboat, so dense that its holy glow could not pass through entirely, each one a hundredth weight, and in all that awing was sadness. The perdition of his son was palpable, the transgression against him by the other, who in heaven was to keep their son, their brother, their heir smothered as such. The war between them was one without mercy, the inheritance Oidorak adrift amid the dirt. Deep was the mournful melody as it poured from Alim's mouth. Terrible, it cracked the cornerstone of fate. The choir of the world could not muster to meet his booming voice, for he had made ourselves the adversary of God. And thus he departed, a wistful goodbye. I cannot say where he is gone, only that he was. Am I to act as his embouchure and functionary, to be the mouthpiece of the instrument of his will? In the sharpest timber, I cry out to the prophet, the priest, our unburdened king. Grant us the wisdom and serenity to maintain balance until your return. Forgive this wretched form and smite the corruption that besets us. We, your endearing children, recite this outro forever until your return, so be it. Consistently among Gowring's text, the six original great races of Kerr Ashlan men, dwarves, elves, orcs, kobolden, dragons all maintain some semblance of mutual devotion to Yannis' songs. Though lyrical variations and their interpretations vary widely, RPC 931's description here is consistent and remains so even following Kerr Ashland's manifestation. While many adherents to the original faith dedicated to the dragon were purged by the High King of the Spire Elves in the novels as part of the backfired rituals used to tether the Castle of Dreams, strains of the so-called Old Faith have re-emerged following the Kerr Ashland Anomaly's manifestation and baseline reality. Despite having never released any complete canonical descriptions of Alim, the various renditions by all races and people to Kerr Ashland directly matched those within Gowan's personal sketches, recovered from prior publisher correspondence preceding his death. See Figure 2. Further elucidation on the exodus of RPC-931 remains a mystery to Authority personnel. The catalyst event of which, referenced within the Gautist Ots verse 15, has gained various titles throughout recorded history. Most notably known as the Smothering of the Primordial Flame, all peoples within Kerr Ashland when questioned display some form of innate knowledge on the subject, frequently commenting, there was a war, he lost his son. Epics of Parousia, as sung by Presbyter Giannis. The last of the six chains set old and weary, having rusted roots endemic to our world. Their waning chorus, tempo rubato, rattle languidly to a lull. Corruption remains their eternal enemy. All roads sink into the Grand Pit, Nimni. Dead wind lays stagnant on our backs, for it is the breath of the lamented. The sun and stars burn cold and rain ash upon our faces and our fields. We are as an anhydrous adversary, the void of the waters of creation. Each of the stars fell to earth. The constellation of proud Hassan and old Abos collapsed as a husk to the crash of cymbals. The rest thereafter, each one harmonizing the tones of flutes and low-pitched horns, the earth opened up shattering rock and swallowed whole the lands of man to the beat of drums. The Morrigan crows cawed as a murder signifying there were to be no more battles. It was the crescendo, a cacophony. The signature of time stopped short to the beating of his wings. From beyond the horizon, the misty bed where the sun once slept, the dragon came. A single note of its pearlescent tone silenced the crescenting clangor, and for the last time, he felt that it was good. The world's frail form could no longer stand its might. Its cornerstone ebbed away from old wounds. He who wrote the old magic broke his horns and took the form of his people. From thence he extended with silver branch. From thence he extended the silver branch to the blissful dead, to those living with the old episcopies. Into a truer world, a great flood set out from its forms of legion, a flood so great it washed away not just the shadow of the old world, but all worlds. So be it. As is the testament of the songbearers of old, so be it. 
While every other book within the Ispasoich is considered to be a record of past events, the epics of Perusia wholly reference events that are yet to transpire from the perspective of Giannis. The epics include a rough synopsis of the events within the Kerr Ashlyn series and visions given to Giannis sometimes after Alim's departure. However, both sections were unfinished at the time of Gowring's death. These visions specifically detailed the return of RPC-931, which was said to be the last precursor to the destruction of the world, both analogous to the death of Baldir, or the return of Christ. Gowring himself commented on this ending while attending a book signing for the Caves of Crystal in 2017 as, all storybooks end when their father returns. Members of the Prometheus Promogenitus have adduced based on growth fluctuations throughout Pabe Island, that RPC-931's deific capacity may extend outside of its pocket dimension. We can only assume that each section within the novels, published or not, applies to its anomalous capabilities. Based on the findings above and the passages referenced here, RPC-931 is believed to pose a serious threat beyond what was previously thought possible by Kerr Ashland-based anomalies. The threat level has been raised to purple, to reflect these findings. Fire? In the middle of the sea? Nah, it was just some dusty jolly far from home. We were good at gash then, set to act stag for some black water or, uh, or petrol. You're a jolly, eh? That explains the physique I gather. So you're on leave from Afghanistan or Iraq and then what? What? Nay, Oman was the last place I remember. Sometimes, I felt like that sandbox was more of a home than the Isles. Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, year after year after year. I saw fire rain from the sky in Benghazi. Beast did yog to Alexandria over and over again. Nay, it's just bones. I shan't be prone to dits now. Oman? Alexandria? Why would you be there? There hasn't- Dr. Taggart is interrupted by a knock at the door. Pardon me for a moment. Addendum 931.02 Discovery Reports of RPC-931's possible emergence first came to the authorities' attention on October 13, 2025, following an investigation of the semen destruction relocation of Brianath Lear, a Spire Elf observatory, whose residents, mostly Spire Elves and their servantry, had been in a tenuous two-year treaty at that point with the authority for research and reconnaissance purposes. Known to denizens of Kerr Ashlyn as the Black Company, a moniker associated with a shadowy Known to denizens of Kerr Ashlyn as the Black Company, a moniker associated with a shadowy group of foreign beast hunters and cell swords in the novels that had previously been expelled from Kerr Ashlyn before the book's first beginning, which had initially been unplanned but following the dissemination of rumors among locals after a scuffle on the beach of beginnings had been adopted wholeheartedly by authority personnel. Intercepted calls for help sent by maintenance union personnel stationed at the observatory aiding in its repairs following the manifestation are brief at best and frantically written at worst, as transcribed below. Delivered by bloodlarks, as is customary in Kerr Ashland among Spire Elf communities. The reports reviewed as mere superstitions a year ago were not wrong. They were not wrong. Rocks rain from the sky. Something has raised the seas. Ships turned to trees. The roof became a monster. The roof took Priscilla's head. Help! A serpent haunts the clouds. Harold believes God has woken up, and is passing over the waters. Superstition, I thought it was at first. A former human servant for the Spire Elves in the southwest of the Bay of Wethir in the novels. He has since taken a leading position following Kerr Ashland's manifestation, and maintained himself a key role in brokering a deal between the Spire Elves of Briannath Lear and the Authority. I cannot say he is wrong. I cannot say he isn't wrong. Send any able-bodied MST from Camp Cranach as soon as you can muster. We need help. We need help. None of them were wrong. He says we're not right. He says he wants to fix us. Everything's blue. Why is it all blue? Subsequent investigation of Bria Nath Lear revealed the entire observatory to have disappeared from its former location overnight, 
with no evidence of it having been there in the first place. Scouting nearby using ex situ chartered Axton Hornsby personnel revealed it to have been moved seven miles down the coast. Observable distortions, believed to be from ACS fluctuations, temporarily manifested in the spaces between the juxtaposed positions and across the entirety of the nearby coastline, and to the nearby ruined city of Ellenhall. Anderson Coherency Scale Ellen Hall was one of the three ancestral human cities within Kerr Ashland. It was destroyed by the Elven High King, using enslaved dragons early on in Gowron's novels. Ellen Hall was specifically the religious capital for those devout to RPC-931, and the Yannis wards developed there incidentally became the religious icon for the Old Faith. Roughly two-thirds of the body of the ruins remain suspended upside down in the air, housed within a fluctuating tempest furthermore remaining stationary by unknown means. Most of the observatory's former inhabitants were found with no memory of the events reported in the plea, even going so far as failing to remember the authority's existence in its entirety. The building itself appears to be completely restored to the same state it was described as having existed within Gowron's novels prior to Kara Ashland's manifestation event. All evidence of authority extensions have been scrubbed by an unknown actor. None of the maintenance union personnel stationed at Bria Nathalir were ever recovered among those convened within the building's new location. They have since been presumed dead. What did you find out? You're not going to believe this. He's one of ours. What division? Why didn't anyone report him missing? No, you don't understand. He's R-A-V-A-A-F. Unaware. Supplemental Support. Royal Marines. Look at the file. Major Liam MacDonald served during Operation Battle Axe. Brevity. Even during the Levant Crisis. Went MIA in the 60s. Must be a mistake. He's barely a day over 50 at most. He's bigger than his records say. And he's younger in his photo, too. But it's him. No wife on record but two sons just like he said, Brian and Meishu. Hmm. And what happened to them? Let me see, uh, Brian is the younger one, he… oh, it's like he said. Spit it out, Rissa. Drowned when he was two. So young. What are the other, the one he's looking for? Meishu? He went into the foster system, then up and vanished right when he turned eighteen. Dr. Taggart pauses. Sam? That doesn't make this mystery any simpler. Right. Back on it, then. Find out what you can on Meishu, and get those medical tests done. I'll get back to working on our subject. On it. RPC-931 Second Sighting didn't occur until March 20, 2026, five months after the October incidents. Camp Cronach Long Range Scouts formerly tasked with patrolling the outer southwest perimeter of the corrupted woods, had failed to return to their forward operating bases within the allotted mission parameters. A heavy cavalry Chevalier unit was thereby dispatched to the scout's last known position in the hopes of ascertaining the exact nature of their disappearance. Immediately upon reaching the eastern border of the corrupted lands, the knights were bypassed by a considerable force of magical beasts fleeing the area. Immense pillars of golden and black smoke were seen rising from the general direction of the Castle of Dreams. They were observed first by personnel at Watcher's Rest, and within seconds, the smoke was visible throughout the entirety of Authority Influence Zones. As suddenly as the smoke appeared, it seemingly demanifested. As it went, a small earthquake shook Camp Cronach, and a single member of the cavalry team manifested in his barracks. His debrief is transcribed below. We had barely ridden past the old motor and spire, as they call it, when we saw what looked like some dark cloud moving towards us at an impressive speed. But it wasn't just a cloud, though. Not at all. In it there were rather things of all sorts. Birds. Fairies. Minor winged creatures. Things I'd of course all seen before on prior rangings, but it was different this time. Normally they avoid humans. We barely had time to process the strangest of it all before the rest of the beasts from the woods nearly trampled us. They were all hot-footed as they shot past, all malignant in the sort, 
Then, we saw why. A deafening roar echoed consistently for nearly twenty minutes across the grounds. A path had been cleared through the brush, the whole of it burning unnaturally fast. When the blackness of the smoke had receded for a moment, there was nothing left but a field of fire. As far as we could see, the valley was ablaze. It came upon us so quickly that Bacchus and Turkbull couldn't rein their horses in time, barely getting two shouts out before their lives were snuffed. The flame took them like a flash flood. The flames moved like water. They couldn't even scream when they died. Got all of them but me. I don't remember much from what happened in the thick of the firefight. That was nothing but fire and fear and death. But I do know what happened when the smoke overhead parted one final time, when I looked up at last from my cowering under the burning bush after the roaring stopped. Above me, over the castle to my right, loomed a large blue dragon, bigger than anything I've encountered here, even those wyverns and ash folk ride, goddamn bigger than the bones strewn about the desert, that's for sure. God not even hanging, leaning against it. The ruins looked like a toy compared to it. Before I had even realized it, everything was ash, even my horse. My eyes were fixed on the monster before me. It roared so strongly I felt the pressure in my eyes. The woods reformed almost instantly, and I felt myself pulled back there. I blinked and here I was. The hopeful part of me thinks it's the fact I was last in our ranks that I lived. A trick of fate. The other part knows the truth. I don't know how I know, or why. But I just do. That thing in the black sky somehow knew I was there. It had probably known the whole time. And yet, it passed me by. Following these incidents, which confirmed the existence and allotted the classification of RPC-931, further occurrence have been condensed for the sake of brevity. All authority efforts at this point are to be towards either ascertaining what RPC-931's intentions are and engaging its weaknesses. It is well worth noting that smaller incidents and minor sightings are far more numerous than this subsequent listing, but due to their extreme concision and lack of suitable confirmation by multiple observers, they have not been listed here. Sighting RPC-931-03 Location Shadefell Grove Date April 9, 2026 Casualties Death 40 Unknown Reports A hurried message was received from one of the Conroy emissaries tasked with the diplomatic relations with mixed-race orc and human insurgency groups, colonizing the vast incoherency pockets by the Shadefell Grove to the north of Briss. A small task force of five to ten elite operatives, or knights, trained to fight as a unit. This terminology and combat tactic was derived from unit organizations in the Middle Ages of the same name formed a year or two after the Authority's usurpation of the Dominarchy in the Plains. These groups remained a thorn in succeeding Authority mediation attempts for years, preceding the RPC-931-03 event. Suspected to be a partial result of the collapsed siren codes following the inception of the Kerr Ashland anomaly. They warned of strange happenings in both the native landscape and the movements of the aforementioned insurgency groups nearby in the preceding weeks. Additional reinforcements arrived after a three-day journey impeded by rough weather, only to find the incoherent zones effectively leveled, with no sign of the previous colonies or any of the protectorate conroys that had been stationed in the area. Sightings of RPC-931 flying in the air up to four days post-incident are corroborated by the remaining two teams, who had evacuated the Briss just before the onset of what they called the Blip saying the grove had glowed so brightly it was like the sun was rising in the north. Additional observations. Nothing new has changed since the first two sightings. RPC-931's motives remain unknown, though its threat level to authority, Care Ashland operations continue to climb. The two surviving teams claimed that RPC-931 had reacted negatively to attempted direct armed confrontation which corroborates with its reported demeanor in the RPC-931-02 report. While no bodies have been found in the area, unlike in the RPC-931-01 report, 
none of the native cast were recovered. Sighting RPC-931-04 Location Mistwood, five leagues east of Thiesport Date February 19, 2027 Casualties, deaths, null Report Authority personnel stationed at the newly established Briannath Lear Observatory witnessed RPC-931 displaying unusual behavior high above the Mistwood forest area and the adjacent corrupted zones. Most conspicuously, he was seen stopping at distinctly discordant nebulous spaces within the night sky and seemingly relocating them to their correct spots. How he was able to achieve this, which was obfuscated by the altitude it was observed at, appeared to be by wrapping its horn through the sections of incongruous sky and ripping them from their previous positions, all the while leaving various aurorae in their wake. Additionally, once these sections of the sky were correlated correctly, RPC-931 placed new portions of celestial space in their previous designates. These new sections appear to have been manifested purely by RPC-931. Additional observations Kerr Ashland's night sky remains one of the most incoherent corrupted spaces, moreover the island's entirety. Written sections of Gowring's drawings of constellations populate its visage. These intermix with baseline reality celestial picture, both of which change each evening as Kerr Ashland's stellar rotation is circumpolar in nature as opposed to Pabe Island's more southern orientation. Dr. Locke commented on the sky's orientation during the initial discovery of the Kerr Ashland anomaly as being, quote, like a puzzle with its pieces strewn about, and every night they're mixed again by some unseen force, unquote. Due to this, it is unclear what RPC-931's goal was during the sighting, as by the following evening, the sky returned to its incessantly incoherent state. However, the aurorae generated during this incident were observed passing through Kerr Ashland's border, the first time any abnormality of this nature was detected doing so. The aurorae were noted to be red in hue, informed by electromagnetic interference of Kp equal approximately 6, intermixed with trace amounts of ionizing Grovian variants, approximately 3 VI. While not believed to be visible from the northwestern Scottish coastline, a cover story involving a minor solar flare was disseminated to the media the following day. Sighting RPC-931-05 Location The Nightmare Road on the northwest side of the Corrupted Lands Date April 29, 2027 Casualties Deaths 157 523 Report Over an eight-day period, Several notable members of the Orcish Dominarchy, Under Guild of the Dwarves, and Ashen Folk military commands with their varied cores vanished in a manner similar to blips observed within sighting RPC-931-04. On the evening of the 29th, RPC-931 was observed flying above the Nightmare Road, re-manifesting the various combatants. All three armies converged and, despite all authority garnered truces, immediately engaged in an all-out war against one another, resulting in a decisive Ashen Folk victory. Additional observations All belligerents were noted to be those that participated in the Battle of Brittle Boynes in Volume 3, The Sword of Prophecy. Upon further examination, it was revealed that while the main Kerr Ashland plot had carried on past this point canonically, in line with the books, the battle itself had not taken place. The Battle of Brittle Boynes was a major plot point for the series as it set the Ashen Folk as the predominant faction. Furthermore, it set in motion Meghead Blood Risen's redemption arc after he was captured and later rescued by Hassan. As none of these events transpired, the areas they were purported to have happened were notably more incoherent and corrupted than the surrounding spaces. It was also noted that as each soldier fell, their children, specifically those born sometime chronologically after Volume 3, ostensibly ceased to exist. Further study into chronologically altered events has been deemed non-feasible, as all parties involved are unable to recall said previous knowledge or actions after the altercation. It is not currently known if these occurrences can affect Authority personnel. Sighting 
RPC-931-06 Location The Deep Refuge Date July 29, 2027 Casualties Deaths 0 Negative 1 Report An Authority Research Expedition Team, studying the Lord of Ashes' thaumaturgical geothermic properties, witnessed RPC-931 flying towards the glass ruby gate of the Deep Refuge. Once there, the entity was met with a heavily armed Ashen Folk Defense Force. As it shrugged off the blows of wrought iron anti-siege weapons and the most powerful spells available to the elven archmages, it breached the gate and welled up, seemingly preparing to unleash its famous fiery breath. However, RPC-931 instead whistled a single plaintive and sonorous tone for several seconds into the cavern's opening, then flew away without further incident. Additional Observations Post-incident observation remained inconclusive for some time, as no greater purpose to RPC-931's actions could be easily discerned. The only notable reaction produced by the entity, his brief airy melody, appeared to have had a minor mimetic effect on the indigenous Care Ashland occupants within an unidentified proximity of the event. As he sang, the song transformed for each individual into a variant of their Amren Brees. Literal Translation Birth Song Amren Brees are prophetic psalms performed in a manner similar to Aldim's actions, referenced to verse 3 of the Canticle of the Sigisir. Each person's Amren Brees details their life achievements and is unique to only them. Update. Four days after the event, a disturbance was reported inside the tomb of Hassan Maza. The tombstone door, erected by the late Sivileth Vivath, appeared to have been opened from the inside by its now risen sole occupant. Hassan's miraculous recovery from death has since been kept a secret by both the Ashen Folk aristocracy, who feared this miracle would set in motion another uprising, and the authority to the same extent. Hassan has refused to communicate with any representatives from either party, and has only expressed heavy chagrin since his revival. His only statement post-reincarnation, allegedly made as he was seen departing his former grave, is as follows. I was brought back not once but twice, and this time you were dead, not even there for me. Should not even my failings be my own? Hassan has since escaped his internment, turned holding cell, following a lapse of security by Ashen Folk personnel. When reprimanded, each member of the Ashen Folk Guard stated that Hassan was a divine being, now beyond their right to hold. All Authority Conroids have been ordered to attempt to detain Hassan in the event they locate him. I'm sorry about that, I was just… Did you find me, boy? No, not directly at least. We're looking into it, even making headway. <laughs> How old are you, Liam? What? You're being a real naff now, blethering on. Can you just answer the question? Eh, I cannot remember. You can't remember? I feel old, though. Old enough to make the dirt feel like a lad again. I feel like a regular Methuselah. Well, you don't look that old, but according to what we have, you should be dead, Liam. Dead? Yes. Who said that? I don't… It's not important, sir. Hmm. Suppose it's like the good book says, Eve to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who has sustained you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. The Saya? Chapter 48 That's all well and good, sir, but it doesn't really answer my question. Liam says nothing. Shuffling is heard as Dr. Taggart looks at the file Risa brought him. Right. Maybe this will get us there. Were you born in 1921? Aye, I cannot recall exactly, but it sounds spot on. Well. Going off on biblical parallels, I'd say you're more Moses than Methuselah. By the numbers, you're nearly 106 years old. Nay. What year do you think it is? Come off it! It's only been a decade or two since the big one. The big one? You mean the Second World War? Aye. That was over 80 years ago, Liam. Let's go back to the last thing you remember, alright? The fire, you said. I was guarding a lorry. It was full of petrol. 
We were all chin-strapped. Then those Gami rebels started lobbing shots at us. A big one hit the truck, then fire, then water. When we found you? Nay, I was… it was like a memory. Or a dream, I thought. Looking up at Meishu at his disc. It was all drink and bury you. Nay, I was… it was like a memory. Or a dream, I thought. Looking up at Meishu at his desk. It was all dreek and weary about, like some loathsome nothing. I heard him rambling up there, like he was a lad reciting the scriptures. It was my boy. A kin it was him. A father knows his boy always, but his boy's was old and strong like mine. He was saying something like, Woven together in the depths, your eyes saw me unborn body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I don't understand. Liam, I… Dr. Risa knocks at the door. Observation Conclusion All appearances of RPC-931 were thus observed to involve two consistently recurring trends. Disappearance, death, or reincarnation of individuals within the Kerr Ashland story matrix. Some kind of modification or alteration of various events and locations, though the permanence of said modification varies from sighting to sighting. Additionally, it is now evident that every alteration made by RPC-931 appears to be correlated directly with some degree of explicit deviation to the novels. These are believed to be caused by authority modification, defunct transfer between Gowring's works and the Care Ashland Anomaly Manifestation or the hypothesized influence of other external actors yet unknown to us. While initially assumed to be entirely random, analysis of newer sightings of RPC-931 juxtaposed against the aforementioned myths and supposed earlier sightings locations brought to light information that effectuated several new hypotheses. Data recorded from installed AECR centers integrated into the non-anomalous outer section of the Kerr Ashland barrier were introduced to measure approximate coherencies in Care Ashland proper, with conflicting findings, but not too divergent to lend a dearth of conclusion. A new trend has been revealed, beyond initial observation, though it still uses incomplete data to make its assertions. RPC-931 has drawn exclusively to locations with either high or low coherency, approximately ranging from differences of 2.5 or greater on the coherency scale. While most of Kerr Ashland fulfills such a descriptor, RPC-931 explicitly avoids areas that match its baseline frequency of approximately 3.65. Sites impacted by RPC-931 all initially had coherency readings that far surpass normal quanta, only to display anti-entropic qualities in the months following at a level roughly equivalent to levels within Kerr Ashland's baseline. Put simply, things intrinsically become normal. RPC-931's movements are therefore, theoretically, not unpredictable at all. They can be tracked, and possibly also even something we had previously thought impossible, containable, inside an area of perpetually fluctuating coherency. As such, Page's End has been proposed as the perfect containment site for RPC-931 as its entropic qualities has as of yet remained immeasurable. The most daunting course of action now is leading RPC-931 there via the use of several theorized destabilization methods, based on the recommendations of philologists and thaumaturgical experts, approved for application. Containment protocols have been hereby updated to reflect this. To Liam. I'll give you a moment to process. To Dr. Risa. What have you got? Tests came back. All of them aired out. What? I was confused too. So I went down to that lab and looked for myself. Blood. DNA. All his biometrics read null. What do you mean? He's not organic, Sam. But we drew blood. I can hear him breathing while we've been talking. What? All his samples were the same. A complex medium of various acids and iron sulfate. That's not my department, Risa. In English, please. He's ink. No. You don't think? I do. He's from the Anomaly. He has to be. No, no. I mean, do you suppose he's our big bad? The Dragon? 
I'm afraid you're speaking outside my department now. Care to elaborate? He who wrote the old magic broke his horns and took the forms of his people. From thence he extended a silver branch to the blissful dead. It's not far off from the Apostles' Creed. Jesus. What? I don't… The father and his prodigal son. Or maybe the other way around this time. It's Locke's transference theory. Dr. Taggart takes a deep breath and collects himself momentarily. Let me guess. You couldn't find Mayshu in the system because he changed his name. How did you know that? My people have only just put that together, and we haven't even figured out what he changed it to. Don't bother. I already know bits of this old sob story from the interviews. I was a fan, you see, of Mayshu's. Or, if I'm right, of Gowering's. Wait. Gowering? I don't mince words, Risa. You mean… Yes. I think that one of Liam's boys is none other than the man himself, Gowering. Containment Attempt RPC-931 Department Containment Authorization 3 CA Subject RPC-931 Date October 21, 2028 Staff Dr. Locke Dr. Asharu Knight Captain Vaughn Forward A task force comprised of Knight Captain Vaughn's Conroy armed with automatic Mark V crossbows with runic explosive bolts, supplemented with an Ashen Folk Battle Mage Brigade, have been tasked with protecting a mobile destabilization unit, en route towards Page's End. Each knight has been baptized and displays a Yannis Ward, embossed on their breastplate, in line with current containment protocols. Once RPC-931 is taken to bait, the task force must attempt to lead the entity towards their destination. It is currently believed that Page's incoherency fluctuations will relatively quickly trigger the Dragon's instinctual desire to fix its surroundings, and shift its focus off of the task force. Due to the aforementioned indelible fluctuations, the time in which the group must attempt to distract RPC-931 is unknown. This operation is dependent on a variable of luck. However, as RPC-931's effects continue to escalate in unforeseen ways, we are faced with no other option. Operation Status Failure RPC-931 is believed to have broken containment. Reports remain inconclusive post-op, but according to AECR automatic alarm systems along the northern section of Pabe Island, RPC-931 appears to have broken through the barrier and entered baseline reality. These findings are also supported by a series of sudden salvos of Grovian radiation from the excursion point. 35.1 VI Additionally, one of RPC-931's horns was located in the North Sea three days post-incident. Object Class Escalation to Omega is currently pending approval. As modern recording technology is not available to us within Care Ashland, the explicit details of the operation's failings are unknown. However, due to the abundance of eyewitnesses from the subsequent recovery of every Authority member taken by RPC-931, the general order of events is quite clear. Knight Captain Bond's testimony of the event remains the most revealing and concise. His debrief is transcribed below. Debrief Interview 93101-01 Interviewed Knight Captain Bond, Kilo-05 Officer Interviewer Dr. Locke, Chief Care Ashland Researcher Begin Log 1435, October 21st 2028. You know the rigmarole. What happened out there? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. That was a mess. We knew this was a crapshoot from the start, but it really went ass up. Doing from the start, hmm? Hardly. We couldn't have asked for a smoother op. Everything went according to plan. We set up on the ridge above while I had the pointy ears guard the destabilizer. They handled the ships better. What was that thing, anyway? The device? Yeah. Classified. Pfft. <laughs> Regular rigmarole. Anyways, we got it running and sure enough, the dragon took the bait. We stepped up as close as we could to the edge, but it was so ass-backwards out there you couldn't really judge distance. Did you notice anything unusual about its behavior? 
You're kidding, right? It's a dragon. I mean, the wards and everything seem to work, if that's what you're on about. He barely noticed us. Between our fire support and the spells from the pointy ears, it was quite the show. I say fire support like we were doing anything, but it was more like jangling keys in front of a baby as we carried on. God, the size of it though. Gave me vertigo just being near it as it followed us all the way to the edge. I don't understand. You suffered no casualties, and it sounds like it all went perfectly. You even managed to locate and rescue the missing personnel taken by the entity. Where were they? Were they in Page's End? Hold on, I'm getting to that. I knew this debrief was coming, and I still don't know how to describe… well, I don't even know what. You see, it was all fine and good until he switched focus and went for… it. As I said, it was perfect, but there was something else there. Something else? You've seen it, right? Page's End, I mean. It's wild. Land becoming sky with rips in the foreground like it's made of paper. Black, inky rain shooting every direction. And those are the bits we can even make sense of. There was something else inside it, too. It almost looked like another dragon, malformed and scaleless. It was fleshy-looking, but the sound it made was something like screeching metal. The ashes froze at the sight of it. They called it the Eidolon Worm. Wait, you saw the Eidolon Worm? Not for long. Our boy didn't take too kindly to it. I think it's what pissed him off. The second this worm popped up, well, that's when he stopped caring about us. That would match our intel on both entities. Well, 931 ripped its head off. Pardon? It beelined right for it. Jesus. The sounds those two made when they hit. They easily outclassed the explosion from our bolts just by smashing into each other. Then, in what felt like an instant, there was nothing. Their bodies started almost phasing in and out, blinking. One moment you see the two beasts going at it, the next, they're gone, or static like a painting, or like ink bleeding off a piece of paper. Static, yeah, that's it. It was like one of the old TVs, when the signal was on the fritz and the picture waved about or inverted at random. Even felt like other channels filtered through as they shot about. It really was like warming up the old tubes in the TV. It's like the whole place was coming alive. The worm was outside its weight class, though. 931 pinned it down and before I realized what was happening, bit its whole head off. We had no idea the worm was there, just on the edge. If we knew… Doesn't matter, because the second 931 took that bite, something happened. It was like it burned him, or maybe he choked on it. He started thrashing about even worse than that headless monster, coughing up insane amounts of water, and when it hit the ground it immediately evaporated into a heavy, misty fog. Here's the crazy part, though. That's where we found our missing people. In the worm? In the mist. They just wandered out of the thickest parts in tens and twenties, just where you couldn't see clearly. Not just our guys, either. Everyone taken by 931. All the while the worm was spewing its oily black blood from its neck. I say blood, but it was more like ink. It intermixed with what was already there, and started coming down hard now, like the sky, or ground for that matter since all aspects of what was normal just lost themselves in that kaleidoscope. Ripped open. It was an absolute hellstorm. Some of it looked like it was forming words as it fell. I recognized some of the letters, but I couldn't read them. Possibly due to low ACS interactions with left brain functions, it gives off that dreamlike impression of indecipherable text. Remember when we did that op outside of Site 014 recontaining 139? I remember, but this was something else entirely. All of it. It felt biblical. I was frozen in awe. But what made the dragon try to breach containment? Between the chaos of the blood rain, the mists, and the hordes of people fleeing in terror after just being revived, I guess. It's hard to say what happened. It must have been like sharks in the water, or whatever else calls that shithole home, because the whole place seemed to shimmer with excitement. Shim? Yeah, I know, it's an odd turn of phrase, but the air felt electric. The deepest holes in that torn foreground woke up. Eyes waking to see the commotion. 
and in them I traced the black lines from the coagulated rain to the worlds within. Starting from the blood of the Eidolon worm, five rivers bled into the tears of those mirrored spaces. At their basins, the little Icor boiled. From the waters and the formless tears, they came. Captain Bond pauses momentarily to catch his breath. It was obvious they must have been creatures from care once. Ones that you usually see close to the edge, maybe fairies, or those fish people we encountered when scouting the sunken isle three years back. But whatever they'd been, they sure as hell weren't that anymore. I saw smoky hydras with shitloads of eyes instead of scales, lizards with bird heads covered with slimy feathers, elves with webbed wings instead of arms and legs, humans too, but they had no faces. They didn't feel real. They felt dreamlike compared to the elves next to me, compared to 931, compared to what came next. Hmm. Sounds to me like mild symptomatic wanderer syndrome. It's not particularly common for that severity to hit Kara Ashland's staff. Perhaps… No, you… Ugh. You could be right. I remember all of it so vividly, though. A shifting city that felt like a hungry lie. A sea of doubtless corpses so old, existence itself grew around them. An ocean of husk and ash, with their grand tunnelers that rivaled the dragons before me. A bastard world… A bastard world of brazen wings and whispering snakes, supping on bloody ecstasy. A void so black and featureless that I couldn't fathom its… erm… Um, anything, really. The younger Vivat commented somberly at it. The eyes of the father rest in his quiet tomb. I still don't know what he meant by that exactly, and honestly, I don't think he does either. Viscount Sybil Vibath, son of Sebleth Vibath, led the Ashen Folk Battle Mage Brigade for this operation. You couldn't make the last one out, but Vibath could? That's possible evidence of a native's ideological transference. What? Never mind. It's just a theory. So what happened next? He up and left. I cannot say why. Whether it was from the Eidolon Worm leaving some final malediction, or some wound sustained from Page's end eternal bullshit. Personally, I think he saw something in those worlds that hurt him in some other way. That's what I felt then. Something just deeply painful. He sped off with purpose, and when he hit that barrier, well, the show wasn't over. It was like a goddamn nuke. An explosion with every color of the spectrum shooting out. Interesting. It didn't quite look like that on our end. So what did you do? Honestly, I thought he was dead after all that, so we rounded up everyone we could manage and marched back. End Log 1527 October 21, 2028 Christ, how did he know? Pardon? How did he know something happened? To his son? He knew. You could hear it in his voice. There's so much we don't know about that place, Care Ashland. What Gowering meant. What did he think? Did he intend for this to happen? Was it Gowering's thought to the boy who saw his father as invincible? Or was it that father's desire to be with his son in any way he could? Maybe it was us, when we saw a greater meaning or purpose when there was none. My colleague Lancel believes it was simply Gowering, the author, tying literary themes of God the Father to a literal base. Dr. Taggart pauses. And you? I'm a well-read man, Risa, as I'm sure you've guessed, even for my field as filled with crackpots and hellions as it is. One of my favorite literary critics once wrote something similar to all this mess, claimed that writing is that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject slips away, the negative where all identity is lost, starting with the very identity of the body writing. I've always loved that bit, even committed it to memory. But I don't think I ever understood it. Not until now. <laughs> it's all so literal. Dr. Taggart is directly quoting La Morte d'Arthur by French literary critic Roland Barthes, 1915-1980. Very pretty, Doctor, but enough waxing poetic. What do we do with him? Prep a permanent containment cell. Get Dr. Locke on the phone. He'll love to rack his brain on this. Are you going back in there? No, I can't. How do I tell him both his sons are dead? How do I tell him that he is too? Beyond that, 
How do I tell him that he is, in all likelihood, nothing more than any of the other characters from his boy's stories? Go print out those reports, Risa. Dr. Locke will want to see them. Risa nods, leaving the room. <sighs> Besides, by the look on his face, I think he already knows. End log. Registered Phenomena Code 931 Object Class Beta White Hazard Types Sapient Possibly Animated Containment Protocols RPC-931 is to be held in a standard furnished humanoid containment cell at Site-007. The subject, which is now believed to be non-anomalous outside of the aspects of its composition and creation, is innocuous and subsequently housed within the site's low security wing. Items recovered relating to RPC-931 are to be housed within various alpha-level secure lockers within the site subsections. To date, the Authority has recovered RPC-931's left horn, several hundred scales, and five sizable claw fragments. RPC-931 is cordial, and displays extensive knowledge of the Kerr Ashland anomaly. As such, he has been given Class Zero CA affiliate clearance in regards to pertinent matters on the subject in exchange for additional amenities. Per contra, RPC-931 is to be explicitly denied access to information pertaining to religion or thaumaturgic studies. Staff members at Site-007, per their overwhelming request, may visit RPC-931 when approved by either Dr. Locke or Dr. Taggart. Warning, under no circumstances is RPC-931 to be permitted in or near the Kerr Ashland Anomaly as the stability of the dimensional barrier has normalized in the months following the emergence incident. Further destabilization of this nature could lead to a cascading coherency collapse. Description. As RPC-931's delineation's descriptors are currently being debated by members of the Research Division, it has been designated simply as a lesser extra-dimensional entity. However, as an extra-dimensional anomaly of this specific nature has never been observed prior, Skeptics among the staff have voiced concerns about the entity's affable nature. RPC-931 resembles a Caucasian male weighing approximately 200 kg and standing at 229 cm. Despite having manifested within the Kerr Ashland Anomaly sometime between 2020 and 2025, the entity claims to be one Liam MacDonald. Liam MacDonald, 1921-1965 was a Scottish-born Royal Marine who went MIA, presumed dead, during the Dofar Rebellion. He was survived only by his son Maceu MacDonald, who later changed his name to Randolph Gowring in 1978 after leaving the foster care program and before releasing Spelltaker in the later half of the same year. Due to the poorly understood nature of the Kerr Ashland manifestation event, the precise parameters surrounding the ideological merging of Liam MacDonald and Ah Lim has been theorized to be based on the subconscious transference of Gowron's inspirations and personal feelings towards its father. See Ideological Transference Theory and Subconscious Metrics by Dr. Locke for further information. Although this thesis was initially dismissed, as all Kerr Ashland manifestations have to appear in text at some point throughout Gowring's shared story matrix, Authority personnel later discovered an unreleased book dedication featuring RPC-931 set to be on the jacket cover of Volume 6, Castle of Dreams. Following a re-investigation in 2029 reviewing the materials confiscated from Gowring's publisher after his death, it reads as follows. It may come as a shock to those of you who never put two and two together, that not once have I ever dedicated my work to anyone. I always thought it was such a silly premise, to attribute one's pursuits like some gift outside of the logical confines of their perseverance and dedication to the craft. That is, until I reached this point, the accumulation of thirty-six books, and with this the thirty-seventh. Now the folly of my prideful youth has faded. I dedicate this series to you, my late father, to whom I owe more inspiration than I can rashly fathom at such an emotional peak. You taught me to be a man and fear God. I know you left to protect me. I know you left because of what happened. 
and I know you loved me, even if you were unable to say it at the end. A toast of Adam's wine in your honor, and may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields, and until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. To the God-fearing Major Liam MacDonald.